Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Hello, hello. Welcome back to our podcast. Today is going to be exciting. You're going to be witnessing sort of a retelling of my research, connect your dots kind of excursion down a rabbit hole to finally get to a powerful man that most of you most likely haven't heard of. And his name is Jerome Kagan. So let's start how I got to Jerome. I had seen a quote on Facebook a while back when I was still on social media. I haven't been now for, gee, probably six or seven months. And it was a post that said, the father of ADHD, Dr. Leon Eisenberg, had said just before his death that ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease, right? So this is supposedly the father of ADHD. And this is supposedly the statement that he made just before his death. Well, what I wanted to do with this is go to the fact checkers on what I call the mainstream side. And it doesn't get any more mainstream than Snopes, right? So I decided to go uh, look for this quote and see uh, what Snopes thought. So I'm reading this from a... uh, a Snopes fact-checking page, which I will link to, um, you know, in the show notes. And by the way, if you're pro or anti Snopes, it's really besides the point right now. The point I'm trying to make is that if we go to a mainstream narrative type of outlet who fact checks it, you know, they're going to be pretty conservative, at least to represent their side. So I figured this would be a uh, fairly well fact checked to make, you know, to prove that that statement wasn't true. Because let's face it, there's a huge interest behind ADHD as a disorder. And to have the father, the quote unquote father of ADHD say it's a fictitious disease, uh, you know, uh, they're going to fact check it. So here we go. So I'm on Snopes. And like I said, I will link to this. So again, the, the title is Dr. Leon Eisenberg. ADHD is a fictitious disease, question mark. And, uh, you know, on Snopes, it says rumor. Dr. Leon Eisenberg, the father of ADHD, said just before his death that ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. So Snopes went to town, did some research. Again, the claim is that Dr. Leon Eisenberg, the father of ADHD, said just before his death that ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. Well, the rating that Snopes gave it is mostly true. So they're breaking it down to what's true, what's false. What's true, a German to English translation of an interview showed that Eisenberg said something similar to ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. What's false is that Eisenberg, this is according to Snopes, what's false is that Eisenberg was referring to the influence of social and environmental risk factors for the condition. That's interesting. Because if you've been listening to uh, our podcast here, to past episodes, you know that we're huge on the environment, the influence of the environment on the nervous system and ultimately the brain and the behavior of children. So what they're saying is what's false is that Eisenberg was referring to the influence of social and environmental risk factors for the condition. So it's kind of like saying... He's not saying the entire disease or disorder called ADHD is fictitious. This is what they're saying. But really, he wasn't referring to the disorder at large, but more to the influence of social and environmental risk factors for the condition. So we'll have to dig a little deeper. That's what we're doing today. 
So it says the origin of the story. Dr. Leon Eisenberg, who passed away at the age of 87 in 2009, was a prominent figure in the field of child psychiatry, who during the 1950s and 60s conducted medical studies of children with developmental problems, including some of the first rigorous studies of autism and attention deficit disorder. As described by the British Medical Journal, BMJ, Dr. Eisenberg transformed child psychiatry by advocating research into developmental problems. Early in his medical career in the mid-1950s, Leon Eisenberg became fascinated with the childhood mind. Wanting to know more, he broke free from the shackles of the Freudian psychoanalytic dogma that dominated child psychiatry at the time to conduct groundbreaking biologically based research of childhood developmental problems. This research included the first randomized clinical drug trials in child psychiatry. I think what Leon brought to the field was a different way of thinking, thinking out of the box, said David DeMasso, chairman of psychiatry at Boston's Children's Hospital and professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. He was thinking in terms of biology, of evidence-based treatment way before anybody else. He was a biopsychosocial model at a time when psychoanalytical thinking was the norm. Eisenberg's direct involvement as a child psychiatry researcher was over by 1967 when he moved to Harvard Medical School as chief of psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. But in a dozen years, he had helped transform the discipline. So let's go back to ADHD. Although describing Dr. Eisenberg as the inventor or father of attention deficit disorder, ADD, and or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, might be challenged by some as a bit of an exaggeration. He unquestionably contributed a great deal to the body of knowledge on which modern diagnoses and treatment of those disorders is based. Given Dr. Eisenberg's recognized authority and expertise in this field, therefore, those who feel that ADD and ADHD are misused and overemployed diagnoses which serve to Oh, uh, so let me read this one more time. Apologies. That's a long sentence. Given Dr. Eisenberg's recognized authority and expertise in this field, therefore, those who feel that ADD and ADHD are misused and overemployed diagnoses, which serve to excuse bullying and recklessness and offer a sense of alleviation of personal responsibility among those diagnosed, would indeed find validation if Dr. Eisenberg had proclaimed ADHD is a fictitious disease. I've been seeing this story making the rounds about how the alleged inventor of ADHD, a Dr. Eisenberg, had a sort of deathbed confession. And in an interview with Der Spiegel, that's a German uh, magazine, seven months before he died at 87, said ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. So Leon Eisenberg, the father of ADHD, is quoted as saying in Der Spiegel, the German uh, magazine, that ADHD is a fictitious disease shortly before his death. So Snopes goes on to say the claim that Dr. Eisenberg asserted ADHD is a fictitious disease is reproduced on countless websites as something he said seven months before his death in his last interview, which would place the date of his utterance around February 2009. When documentation for the putative quote is provided, it references an article often described as a cover story published in the German weekly magazine Der Spiegel on 2nd February 2012. We found, this is Snopes, we found that the German language version, version of Der Spiegel ran an article in 2012 that skeptically examined the large increase in diagnoses of mental disorders in recent years and quoted Dr. Eisenberg on that subject. A software-based translation of that article from German to English does describe Dr. Eisenberg as the father of ADHD and report that during his last interview, he said something similar to ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. However, when one allows for the va vagaries of translation from German to English and reads the statement in context, it's clear that Dr. Eisenberg wasn't asserting that ADHD isn't a real disorder, but rather that he thought the influence of genetic predispositions for ADHD, rather than social environmental risk factors, were vastly overestimated. So here, so that's the crux, that's the point, right? So you may have followed already and you get it, but I'm just going to explain it here. 
So when we go back up there to Snopes' uh, mostly true, right? Remember it said what's true, what's false. So they agreed that a German to English translation of an interview showed that Eisenberg said something similar to ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. They're saying that's true. So he's made that statement. And this is according to mainstream fact-checking site Snopes, right? Again, whether you agree or disagree with Snopes is not the point here. The point is that any mainstream narrative-believing media, including fact-checking site Snopes, will be conservative, will be very skeptical of such intense statements, right? ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease coming from the father of ADHD. That could be very harmful to many interest groups. We don't need to go into detail here. But my point is, they're saying that's true. So he did make a statement. What they're saying was false was that he wasn't referring to ADHD as not being a real disorder, but he was referring to uh, what I just read, and I'm going to read it again. However, when one allows for the vagaries of translation from German to English that reads the statement in context, it's clear, right? So they're now saying the statement was read, but what was clear now is that Dr. Eisenberg wasn't asserting that ADHD isn't a real disorder, but rather that he thought the influence of genetic predisposition for ADHD, meaning, oh, it's genetic, there's nothing you can do, versus what he's saying is that these social environmental risk factors are actually more impactful on the young nervous system and brain and therefore their behaviors of a child, right, than genetics. And we've talked about this before with Dr. Bruce Lipton, who clearly talked about, first of all, there's no ADHD gene. Second of all, we're never predetermined to get any disease or disorder, we may be predisposed. But what's the difference between predisposition and predetermination is the influence of the environment on our nervous system and our brain. That's a very important thing here to understand. I hope you follow. It took me a while to follow, and maybe you already have. I don't want to underestimate your intelligence, but I want to make sure if you're new to this information that you're aware that when people say ADHD is genetic or possibly genetic, or it could be, or, you know, that that's incomplete as a statement. It's incomplete as a fact, as a truth, because we're not, and this is scientifically proven, we're not predetermined to get a, any disorder or um, a disease, but we could be predisposed. And in the case of ADHD, what Dr. Eisenberg was saying here is, look, we may be predisposed, but there's no ADHD gene and we're not going to for sure get ADHD. It's not a predetermined thing. It's a predisposed thing. But rather what has more impact on us to potentially or a child potentially getting a, a, a mental disorder or labeled with a mental, mental disorder such as ADHD is the environment, the social environmental risk factors. That's what he was saying. And that's in essence, they're basically confirming both his points. They're saying, yes, he did say that, the statement, right? That ADHD is a good example of a, a fictitious disease. He did say that, but he actually was more referring to what I was just explaining. Hence, they're, they're basically confirming everything he said. And to me, again, this is the father of ADHD or the supposed father of ADHD, right? To me, that was like, oh, okay, well, that's good. So I continued reading. One out of every 10, uh, sorry, one out of every 10, 10 year old boys already takes an ADHD drug daily. But the scientific father of ADHD has followed the explosion of prescriptions with growing horror. Leon Eisenberg took over the management of psychiatry at the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and became excuse me, and became one of the most famous psychiatrists in the world. In his last interview seven months before his death from prostate cancer at the age of 87, he distanced himself from his youthful indiscretion. A tall, thin man with glasses and suspenders opened the door to his apartment in Harvard Square in 2009, invited me to the kitchen table and poured coffee. He said that he would never would have thought this, his discovery would someday become so popular. ADHD is a prime example of a fabricated disorder, Eisenberg said. The genetic predisposition to ADHD is completely overrated. Instead, 
child psychiatrists should more thoroughly determine the psychosocial reasons that can lead to behavioral problems, Eisenberg said. Are there fights with parents? Are there are problems in the family? Such questions are important, but they take a lot of time, Eisenberg said, adding with a sigh, prescribe a pill for it very quickly. On a related note, in August 2012, their Spiegel English language interview with now retired Harvard psychologist Dr. Jerome Kagan quoted Dr. Kagan as being critical of fuzzy diagnostic practices and the overprescription of drugs such as Ritalin for behavioral problems in children and as referring to ADHD as an invention. So this is how I came across Dr. Jerome Kagan. Remember, I made dad part-time dad, you know, parent researcher. So I'm not always up to date on every single event that happens daily, right? So it's taken me a while to find certain experts and certain statements, right? This is a interview that goes back to 2012. But this is how I, through this Snopes article, found Dr. Jerome Kagan. And by the way, this is how dots get connected. This is how to deep dive into research is to follow the breadcrumbs, right? So I did. So I came across Dr. Jerome Kagan here, who obviously in this article, in this German Der Spiegel magazine article, uh, backs up Dr. Eisenberg, Dr. Leon Eisenberg, right? So I'm just going to continue and then we're going to dive a little bit into who is Kagan, right? Spiegel, in the 1960s, mental disorders were virtually unknown among children. Today, Official sources claim that one child in eight in the United States is mentally ill. Kagan says that's true, but it is primarily due to fuzzy diagnostic practices. Let's go back 50 years. We have a seven-year-old child who is bored in school and disrupts classes. Back then, he was called lazy. Today, he's said to suffer from ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's why the numbers have soared. Spiegel, experts speak of 5.4 million American children who display the symptoms typical of ADHD. Are you saying that this mental disorder is just an invention? Kagan says, that's correct. It is an invention. Every child who's not doing well in school is sent to see a pediatrician and the pediatrician says, it's ADHD, here's Ritalin. In fact, 90% of these 5.4 million kids don't have an abnormal dopamine metabolism. The problem is, if a drug is available to doctors they'll make the corresponding diagnosis. So this is the end of the Snopes uh, article. So it is now clear here, and you've heard this, that Jerome Kagan says to the question, are you saying that this mental disorder is just an invention? He says, that's correct. It is an invention. So I was thinking, who is this guy? I mean, he's backing up Leon Eisenberg's claim that ADHD is a prime example of a fictitious disease. Kagan says it's correct, it's an invention. We say ADHD is over. Dr. Richard Saul had a book called ADHD Doesn't Exist. Dr. Thomas Armstrong wrote a book called The Myth of the ADHD Child. And there's hundreds of authors and experts pointing at the same thing. What's the thing? Well, before we go there, I thought, let me look into uh, Jerome Kagan. So um, I found a, uh, an article. Jerome Kagan unfortunately passed away uh, May 10th of this year. So very recently, rest in peace, Dr. Jerome Kagan. Who is he? Well, Jerome Kagan, the Daniel and Amy Starch Research Professor of Psychology Emeritus and a path-breaking scholar of developmental psychology, never let a good idea pass him by, no matter where he was when it occurred. So they're going a little bit into who is he, right? This is Harvard. Um, it, it, it's, it's a long article and I will, you know, post to it. But what was interesting, it was such a long, long article on him. And when I searched for the, for the letters, the four letters ADHD, there wasn't a single mention in the Harvard Gazette. To me, that just sort of smells as, you know, of political correctness. So I dug a little deeper and I found multiple websites that talk about him. And so I'm just going to read from uh, some of them and I'll post links to them as well. 
Jerome Keegan is not only a tenured professor at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, he's also considered one of the world's best psychologists. In fact, his fellow academics ranked Kagan the 22nd most eminent psychologist of the 20th century. This ranking put the good professor ahead of Carl Jung. Yes, that Carl Jung, who was ranked 23rd. So if anyone has earned the right to critique one of the most diagnosed mental health conditions in existence, it's Jerome Kagan. And critique the condition, he does. See, Kagan doesn't believe that ADHD is a real condition. That's right. Kagan's position is that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a complete hoax. Needless to say, Kagan's proc proclamation has ruffled a lot of feathers. Well, I bet it has. Psychologists and other medical professionals have gone on the offensive attempting to discredit Kagan's statements. However, Kagan stands firm in his position. Here's a, uh, an article that says, Harvard psychologist reveals ADHD doesn't really exist. ADHD is an invention. Every child who's not doing well in school is sent to see a pediatrician, right? Sounds familiar. I've already read you this one again. And he continues to say, the problem is if a drug is available to doctors, they'll make the corresponding diagnosis. So that's Jerome Kagan, psychologist and professor at Harvard University, who's only passed away, sorry, away this year, RIP, Dr. Kagan. So this man and his, uh, you know, call it his statements, his critiques on ADHD, stood until this year. So we continue in this article, but when you're considered a more impactful psychologist than Carl Jung and Ivan Pavlov, discrediting you is a very difficult thing to do. Kagan is scathing in his criticism of the pharmaceutical industry. In Kagan's view, the excessive amount of money circulating from the sale of prescription drugs is creating a number of problems. First, physicians can financially benefit from promoting and prescribing certain medications. Of course, this can incentivize medical professionals to overdiagnose a condition in order to earn supplementary income. Some doctors earn in excess of hundreds of thousands of dollars just for working with the pharmaceutical industry. By the way, that's a true fact. That's not conspiracy. You, you can look this up. You can uh, track any um, pro-medication uh, expert, psychologist in the ADHD uh, field on Wikipedia, and it will tell you which pharmaceutical companies uh, pay them how much money each year. So that's, that's fact. It's just that most of us don't ever look that up because we're told, well, yeah, no, that's not really true. But it's true. Anyway, in Kagan's view and in the view of most, this is both an immoral and corruptive practice. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Second, pharmaceutical companies have amassed a sizable influence on the political process. Big Pharma spends billions of dollars each year lobbying politicians to get what they want. By the way, again, you can look this up. There are plenty of studies showing that it's not, it's, there's transparency. This is not a conspiracy, not a mystery. Look it up. Big Pharma lobbying Washington. In Kagan's view, this is contributing to the corruptive influences within Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. Yeah, I would say so. I would agree. Finally, Kagan says that the more money flows to psychologists, psychiatrists, and others who conduct research on condi conditions such as ADHD, a result of overdiagnosis and overprescription, right? So they are certainly not exempt from Kagan's criticism. The problem of misdiagnosis and overdiagnosis. According to Kagan, if you do interviews with children and adolescents age 12 to 19, then 40% can be categorized as anxious or depressed. But if you take a close look and ask how many of them are seriously impaired by this, the number shrinks to 8%. Now, these are studies he's done. Kagan uses depression as an example here, but he says that misdiagnosis and hence overdiagnosis occurs across an entire spectrum of mental health conditions. In simple terms, not everyone who displays a symptom or behavior has a mental health problem, especially children who are a bit prone to unpredictability. And I like how they put a little emphasis on bit, especially children who are a bit prone to unpredictability. Misdiagnosis leads to overdiagnosis, which is, in K Kagan's, Kagan's view, a problem plaguing the mental health profession. 
Looking at the number of children diagnosed with ADHD, it is difficult to disagree. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, approximately 11% of children 4 to 17 years of age at 6.4 million have been diagnosed with ADHD as of 2011. Now, that's 10 years ago. Kagan also makes the point that most children diagnosed with ADHD fall under one umbrella. Who's being diagnosed with ADHD? children who aren't doing well in school. It never happens to children who are doing well in school. So what about tutoring instead of teaching? The answer, in Kagan's estimation, a number of big problems exist across the entire fiend of psychology. Might have been field, uh, might be an, a typo here. While he is sharply critical of ADHD over diagnosis, and for good reason, the problems Kagan speaks of span the entire mental health field. As such, there are no simple answers. But Kagan is adamant that mental health professionals must shift their approach to diagnosing ADHD, depression, anxiety, and other disorders. The answer, hmm, here it comes. Psychiatrists and other mental health professionals need to begin making diagnoses similar to how most other doctors do by looking at the causes, not just the symptoms. Again, this is especially with children who often don't have a great ability or desire to fully explain themselves. Now, I just want to be clear here. I just want to emphasize that. When he says the answer is that psychiatrists and other mental health professionals need to begin making diagnoses similar to how most other doctors do by looking at the causes, not just the symptoms, lots of us may hear that and go, well, yeah, that, of course. But that is not what's so when it comes to ADHD, when it comes to the experts, the psychologists, psychiatrists, or even the public, right? The people who, and, and mostly it's people who have ADHD, who will sort of proudly say, I have it because I have, and then they will mention the symptoms. But what he's saying here, and this is, remember, number 22 in the world of most influential ever, psychologists ahead of Carl Jung. I mean, that's like a rating, you know, when you rate tennis players, that stuff is rated and there's a reason why it's rated that way. There's agreement. So he's no small fish, ladies and gentlemen. When he says by looking at the causes, not the symptoms, he's actually pointing to something that I've been saying for years now. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants that we can't self-diagnose or diagnose ourselves with symptoms. We have to look at the causes. To me, that is literally the most important thing, the most important oversight to point out here. So uh, Kagan continues, he's un or this article continues, he is under no illusion that doing so will be easy, right? To look at the, the causes, right? Especially with children who don't have a great ability or desire to fully explain themselves. In fact, when confronted with recent criticism that he's implying mental illnesses are an invention of Big Pharma and others, Kagan goes on the offensive. I love this. Here we go. There are mentally ill people who need help. A person who buys two cars in a single day and the next day is unable to get out of bed has a bipolar disorder. There are people who, either for pre, uh, prenatal or inherited reasons, have serious vulnerabilities in their central nervous system that predispose them to schizophrenia, bipolar disease, social anxiety, or obsessive compulsive disorders. We should distinguish these people. In other words, those responsible for administering brain-altering drugs to children need to search a little deeper. Doesn't seem like an unreasonable proposition does it now? So that was one, um, you could say one article. Uh, most of them that I've read are pretty much about the same facts. So I'm not going to go into that. But again, interesting that the Harvard Gazette, right, celebrating his life, or you could say after his death, writing an article on him, was just simply talking about his work in psychology, very general, mentions where he grew up and, you know, the, some of the studies he's done and the books he's, he's written and so forth. But there was nothing on ADHD. Now, when you have a prominent psychologist, one of the top, you know, the top 22nd in the world ahead of Carl Jung, say, su make such strong statements around ADHD, to me, that's a breakthrough. To me, that needs to be heard. And for that to be not part of his um, 
memorial article, whatever you want to call it, on, on the Harvard Gazette was a little disappointing. But again, I understand Harvard needs to stay politically correct. I get it. So um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, you know, who is Jerome Kagan? I highly recommend you Google Jerome Kagan, K-A-G-A-N. But don't worry, I'm going to list all that stuff for you in the show notes. Uh, what a wonderful man. I mean, you could just see it from his photo on the Harvard Gazette. Um, just a man full of compassion. He fought hard. He really fought hard for the future of our children. And I do feel like I have him, his spirit in my corner because we are out to achieve the same thing. We are out to achieve finally and basically to no longer lab label children with mental disorders to no longer have them grow up thinking there's something wrong with them. They're broken. Their brain is dysfunctional. Because if we really start looking at the causes that, you know, the cause, the behaviors of the children, the so-called symptoms, then we can get an insight into a whole nother world, which is the world of not feeling safe, of a stressed out nervous system locked in defensive mode, and that causes people to behave a certain way. That is very different from children who've grown up with more safety and not just physical safety. That's just one part. There's emotional safety, psychological, you know, of course, physical. There's many safeties that can stress out a nervous system. And he was pointing at that. And I'm so proud to be able to sort of continue that legacy as a dad researcher and go down the rabbit holes, connect the dots, around the true, the real causes of ADHD. Because nowadays we are so used to saying, I have this disorder because of these symptoms. But the symptoms are observed behaviors and we have to ask, why does a child behave that way? That's where we need to start. And that's basically what he said in so many ways. So what a wonderful man, Jerome Kagan. Rest in peace, I wish I could have had you on this podcast. I really wish I, I would, would have had the opportunity, you know. But instead, I, I think I did the best I could to uh, look a little bit into uh, Jerome Kagan and also uh, Dr. Leon Eisenberg, the supposed father of ADHD. So check out the show links if you want to dig in deeper. And uh, thank you for supporting our podcast by being here as a listener. Until next time.